Welcome back to the Biohacks podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by Laura Wilden, uh, osteopath. I've just got that right because I've been I've just said it wrong about three or four times. And we're going, we're going to be talking all things neck pain, um, problem, solution. I'm going to kind of delve into all things neck pain. So, Laura, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We normally start and uh, get a little bit of a background on how you got your job and how you got to where you are today. If you want to give us a, the abridged version of that, that'd be fantastic. Sure. Okay. Um, so actually, when I was really quite young, I wanted to be a GP. Um, my mum's best friend is a GP, and I thought, and still do, think that she was the most fantastic person. Um, as I got a little bit older, I saw that she was quite frustrated with having such little time with people and feeling like everything was a, an anti, like a, an anti-inflammatory, an antihistamine, an antidepressant. And it was kind of patching up a problem as opposed to finding out why it was happening. Palliative medical care system, right? Palliative? Yeah. yeah. Well, kind of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it made me think a little bit more about what I could do to A, spend more time with people in like a, in a medical capacity um, and what I could do, which would be focusing on finding out why these things were happening and then trying to address the root cause of an issue as opposed to putting a plaster on something and sending them away and hoping they don't come back again. Yeah, um, keep going, so, deep, going to the root. Yeah, exactly. And then always being quite involved in sport and having my fair share of injuries, it seemed like a, a natural marry up of career and, and passion, I guess. What sport anyway, did you um, played a lot of football, yeah. um, but was always that kid at school that would put themselves forward for every event at sports day or any sporting team, anything like that. Um, but yeah, more so now, just lots of running, lots and lots of running. So you got the bug for kind of wanting to obviously heal people, go to the route. How did you go about it? What was your kind of uh, accreditation journey? Did you go to university or? I did, yeah. So I was quite late in deciding what I wanted to actually do. Um, I was doing my A-levels when I decided I actually wanted to be an osteopath um, and had chosen psychology, sociology, English literature, and PE for oh, fun, like, you know, no, no direction at all. Um, so I then went to UBA, the University of East Anglia, and did a, a foundation degree in science, which was sort of the equivalent of all of the sciences, IT and maths, A-level uh, in one year. It's quite intense, good wow. fun, but, but an intense year. Um, and that gave me the backbone to be able to go and apply to study osteopathy. So yeah, I did a, a master's um, well, an, an undergrad and then a master's degree at the British College of Osteopathic Medicine. Awesome. Where's, where, where's that based? Um, Finchley Road, North London. Okay, okay, okay cool. Yeah. Perfect. So kind of, yeah. so UEA to London and then, and then from there, did you go straight into practicing? Um, I did, yeah. I mean, so in this line of work, you have to do continued professional development, CPD, you have to do a certain number of hours each year. Um, I did a few courses before I went out into the big wide world, but um, yeah, so I like, did like a, a course in dry needling, a bit like acupuncture, like Western acupuncture, if you like, um, straight off the back of finishing all my clinical hours. But yeah, I worked for one of my lecturers was my first job in her clinic in Pinna. It was great. Awesome. And then, <laughs> I've been in London. Have you been in London ever since then? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Been in London since 2006. Never left. Okay. Okay. And, um, and you mentioned about ergonomics, um, erg the ergonomics. Sorry. Um, yeah. You want to explain a little bit about that as well? Just because you said that has some reference. That's like a nice segue into. Yeah. Sure. So um, I've worked in Canary Wharf for the last, well, the biggest part of the last decade now. Um, and with that, you get a certain demographic. A lot of people working in offices, high stress situations, desk-based work, long hours. Um, and I felt like I could understand why, uh, like what was going on on a musculoskeletal point of view, but felt that actually the importance of ergonomics and knowing what advice I could give patients to give them a more rounded approach to their care was quite important. So I went and worked for a company called Posturine. Um, essentially, they do uh, workstation assessments, trying to keep people in work when they're in pain, but also getting people back into an office, whether that be sort of post-surgery or you know, adapting their workplace around making it like the least stressful situation for your body to be in. And that was back in, oh, blimey, maybe like 2013, 2014. Um, worked with them for a few years, going into lots of offices. It was, it was good. And so the problems that people get from kind of obviously being 
obviously a lot of everybody works right and i guess i've obviously mm. since the information age there's been a much higher percentage of people sat at desk bound jobs and i guess so let's maybe run through a little bit of some of the causes of some of the issues that you kind of normally see with people i guess it was in necks lower backs yeah yeah like neck and lower back are the biggest shoulders would be a third runner up with people working at desks but i use the same analogy but i think it just it it rings true with what people need the take home message but you would never go to the gym and do eight ten twelve sometimes these people 15 hours of bicep curls but yeah we sit at a sit at a desk for that period of time using our postural muscles and then go oh my neck sore i wonder why this is it, you, you times that by five or six days a week over 10 15 20 year career it's you know things it's are going to start to dysfunction yeah the things are going to be problematic it's up. i've heard this provide the, like analogy someone was talking about going on like a long haul flight every day it's like the idea yeah. of being sat in that same position um tapping away at your uh, tapping away at your, your laptop it's kind of like um i guess it's yeah like exactly like you said the, the, these everything we do has an effect on us and it builds up over time, I guess, doesn't it? So, um, yeah, exactly. Like we change our toothbrushes, we buy ourselves new shoes, but we can't change our spine because it wears too much. Like we have to look after it. And so what do people get? Is it like an is it acute pain? Is it chronic pain in the neck? Like let's, let's delve into yeah. the neck a little bit because I think that's obviously an interesting area for Sure. Yeah. So heavy as well. Like, what's the, give us a bit of a break. Yeah. So the the average head weighs between four and a half and five kilos, which is about what eleven twelve pounds, um, which is pretty heavy. And that's when you're perfectly upright and neutral. As soon as you start to sort of lean forwards, it increases substantially. It's actually, I think it was sixty pounds for sixty degrees, which is I don't know under thirty kilos. But you think about what some people would lift in the gym versus what's actually on the end of our neck, which is quite a small structure. Yep. You can see why if you start leaning forwards for all of these hours a day, that it's going to put a lot of stress on these structures. Um, but the type of thing we tend to see, yes, it's definitely it can be chronic and acute and a, a chronic problem can definitely lead to acute flare ups as well, depending on what structure is being affected. Um, tend to see a lot of just accumulative um, muscle tension, which in its own can throw up different problems like cervicogenic headaches, which is basically a headache generated by any dysfunction, whether that be soft tissue or bony in the cervical spine, which is the neck. Um, but that can also have knock on effects with the facets, which are the joints on the back of the neck and even the discs, which are sort of shock absorbing cushions in between each of the vertebrae. Like you put pressure on those for a long period of time, they're going to start to fail to cope with those things. Um, both facet and joint and um, and disc related problems can then start to have an effect on the spinal nerves which exit in between each vertebrae and they from the neck they feed down into your arm so you know, it has this massive knock on effect with lots of different parts of your body but the problem will be essentially coming from your neck. It's really interesting isn't it and I was literally about to ask so I was going to say does this knock on into other things like do headaches and like other migraines and stuff things that people complain other ailments that people get like is it all interconnected and obviously you kind of you literally answered that question <laughs> yeah massively and even things like dentistry like people who um, are highly stressed that might not realize it but are grinding their teeth at night or clenching their jaw at night the jaw articulates with the top two vertebrae in the neck so uh, that's all gonna it's all very very interdependent you, it's very difficult to separate one structure and say this is where your pain is coming from and this is the only part of your body that's failing there will be a knock-on effect of the different structures around it i guess then that even then knocks on into airways and breathing and airways and breathing knocks onto like all sort of like i guess it's like this kind yeah, of yeah exactly exactly how once one really simple small like biomechanical change can mm -hmm. then has a cascade of effects that um hugely yeah so the um vertebrae that come out of the third fourth and fifth uh cervical spine innovate your diaphragm which is hugely involved in breathing so yeah everything's very interdependent wow and so say someone comes in and they've got chronic neck pain the first thing you do is you obviously you sit them down and obviously you get into a little bit of a diagnosis like what are the yeah, so I think um, understand, so anyone that's been to see an osteopath or a physiotherapist will know the first thing that happens is that you talk with them. So what we want to do is try and build up a picture of, you know, what's going on, how long it's been going on for, you know, what movements you can and can't do, what's irritating to it, what seems to make it feel better, so that we can build up a picture of, uh, like, yeah, basically what's going on. And then the next thing we would do is take you through some orthopedic and clinical tests 
which is a little bit like a process of elimination. I mean, obviously it would be slightly guided by the conversation that you've just had, but clinical tests, orthopedic tests are basically putting different structures into positions of stress to see how well they cope with it. If they can cope, they're not affected. If they can't, then you know, that's a problem that's obviously dysfunctional and we need to find out why it's dysfunctional. Is it the primary problem or is it a compensation and a secondary problem? Um, but it sort of, it just builds up this picture. So you start to understand a little bit more about what's going on for that person and then what you can do as a consequence from that. Interesting. And I guess every person you see has some sort of their own nuance uh, or symptoms, like I guess, yeah. and it's your job to understand architecture and, exactly. and environment and then how you kind of what you then the plan of action that needs to be drawn out of that to then create uh, yeah. a system for them to absolutely so certain structures tend to throw up um issues when the biomechanics are being stressed in certain positions so for example the facets are located on the back of the neck tend to be quite painful with any sort of extensions can be rotation um, disc problems tend not to like flexion too much so they're on the front of your neck so if you can imagine putting a chin down to your chest it sort of squashes the front of them a little bit um, so a bit like a, a jam donut or a burger with lots of ketchup in it you squeeze the front of it it's all going to come out of the back that puts stress on different structures there so that's um, that can be problematic so it's building up a, a picture as to what what mechanics are stressing different structures and uh, yeah taking it from there wow interesting and does it ever get so serious that like i guess when somebody comes in and they've got symptoms like if their symptoms are really really strong like do you ever have to like do you ever have to go and see a doctor do you ever use cortisone shots or do you ever like pain relief yeah. and like because obviously i know that you can't do a certain work yeah. that you're going to need to do to reduce absolutely pain first to then allow you to then make a change like well, how does that work yeah, so I think for any medical professional, it's important to know what your limits are. Um, as an osteopath, I am not going to save the world, and I'm very much aware of that. I know my place in terms of things that I can help, and then when I need to refer on to somebody else. Um, if, say, for example, come, someone comes in and they're in really, really acute pain, depending on what symptoms they have alongside that, like, do they have any, I don't know, dizziness, nausea? Have they been passing out? Do they have neurological symptoms? Do they have pins and needles in their arm? Is it numb? How long has it been like that for? That again, builds up that picture as to the level of severity of the effect on the structure that's problematic. And then it tells me whether it's something that I can help that person with or whether I need to be referring that person on to have an MRI or to speak with a consultant. And it might be that, yes, they then have uh, like a steroid injection or, you know, worst case scenario, that person has surgery, but it's important to know uh, when when to stop and refer basically i guess if like somebody's had i guess the two instances are if they've had a major collision or some sort of impact which has then completely rearranged the architecture of the of the neck yeah or i guess yeah. if it's something that they've just ignored and it's then just built up over time i guess it's like yeah time and intensity are like the two like yeah levers exactly. that get pulled i guess aren't they that in, um, yeah really exactly and what you don't want is someone that's had a really acute problem that's let it go on for a really long time because that's the worst of both ends and that causes a lot of problems. But yeah, absolutely. Like something that, you know, all these people we see working at desks that have been doing the same job for 25 years and they're in a real acute pain and they've got, I don't know, like numbness in their arm, then yeah, that's probably a, a time to refer somebody on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, that's really yeah, insightful um so we've had our discussion we've kind of we've kind of got a bit of an idea about the um, direction that you want to go in so then is it a case of putting 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 an action plan in place um maybe john just talk through that and then maybe we should talk about the actual desk and then actually what advice you'd give about um like kind of thing or kind of major uh, like stopping points or kind of things that people should be looking for um, yeah. as prehab, like as we were talking about prehab to begin with. So, yeah. So I will always try and give a person, a patient, an idea of uh, you know what to expect in terms of how long is this going to take to get better. Um, and honestly, I always try and make sure that people have had improvement in at least four sessions. Um, if they haven't had improvement in four sessions, then I'm referring on because there's some that I'm missing and they're not responding to the type of treatment that I can offer um, but yeah 
putting a plan in place, okay, we need to A, get you out of pain first, and then we need to make sure that the biomechanics are as they should be. And then once that's addressed, it's keeping it that way. So rehabilitation, exercise, movement is, is massively underrated, particularly with neck related pain, because you sit and do the same thing all day. There's just a lack of movement there and just accumulative pressure and load through the same structures. So movement is really key, like educating people on that. But I think um, understanding why, that's, that's the biggest thing with any musculoskeletal problem. Why has it happened? Which ties in then with, okay, well, we need to look at um, your ergonomics. We need to look at your posture. We need to look at your stress. Um, all of these things that we can try and address to minimize um, the effects on those structures. And then we can get it better as, as quickly as possible. You know, coming in to have a, a 30 minute appointment once a week when you go and sit at a desk for 12 hours a day and do the thing that's irritating it again, it's going to be a real uphill battle. So it's, uh, yeah. I guess it's not just about what you do in the room, but it's also the advice and guidance that you then set up. To, Hugely. To, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I think Educating really, a patient is huge. Oh no, I think that's a really good point as well as this idea of cause and effect. It's like, everything that's happening to us like you can sometimes can feel so random can't it when you're when you're in your own skin and you're in pain mm. be like, oh why has this happened to me type of like i, I yeah. did and it's like because you're so ingrained in your own self it's kind of hard to see what might actually be causing it from the outside and i think that's a really good point but you said mentioned about cause and effect this idea that something is causing it it's about yeah um, but there could be because of how chaotic being is i guess there's so many different areas yeah. to look at for it to kind of for the answer yeah, um, exactly and that's like the importance of having that conversation with someone before you look at them because really if there is absolutely no cause and effect and there's a few red flags in there then it's way beyond my scope of practice and that person needs to visit their gp or go and see a consultant and find out why that's gone on you know things like cancers don't really have patterns that fit a musculoskeletal um, things that aggravate, things that relieve, it's it's really sporadic. So, you know, it's, yeah, building up that picture is really important. Yeah, no, it's so true, so true. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Um, and, and so say someone has got, so you kind of worked with them a little bit, they're getting some benefit within their four sessions. Um, what advice, like what kind of red flag would you be looking out for at the desk, like for anybody listening to this who uh, has a desk job, which I'm sure there are a lot of, um, mm -hmm. yeah, what kind of advice and guide or what are kind of like maybe the kind of maybe give us three key points to look out for um, sure as, as in like terms of ergonomics you mean yeah no exactly like pain. in terms of prevention yeah. in terms of prevention if they're in pain sure. they can see more if you're not in pain yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so I think one of the most common misconceptions with desk based work is where the top of your screen should be so everyone says, oh, you know, your eye line should be around the, the top of the screen, but you don't work from the frame on the outside of the screen. You work normally from about two, like a third of the way down the screen. So you want to make sure that your screen is high enough that when you're sat up tall, that if you were to draw a line from your eye across to the screen, it'd be about a third of the way down. And that encourages you to sit upright. As humans, we adapt around our eye line all the times. So if it's too low, like I'm working from my laptop here, yeah, you I'm, actually I'm, slump to bring I'm yourself like down. This. Like mine's always down, so... Yeah, exactly. So, and but that's taking your head out of that neutral range. So, it's a it's a heavy head when you put it forwards like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I've never, even, I've never even thought about that. Literally, I just took my laptop off the side a minute ago. So yeah. Um, so like raising like laptop stands, a really cheap, easy solution to try and raise your laptop. Desktops are obviously better because if you have a laptop stand, you then need to have a separate keyboard and a separate mouse, um, and it defies the purpose of it being a laptop. But um, yeah, so screen height is a big one. Chair height is another one because you want, uh, so your feet should be able to be flat on the floor. You want a, a rough angle um, from your hips as a, like a slope to go down towards your knees. So you don't want them to be completely parallel. You want your hips to be slightly higher. That keeps your pelvis in a neutral position. And then that means that you're more likely to sit upright than to kind of curve through the lower back. If the knees were high, for example, you'd round and slump down. Um, but what that in relation to the neck in terms of screen height in terms of chair height you want your elbows to be at 90 degrees and parallel with the desk surface 90 to 100 degrees 
but you don't want your elbows to be below because the instinct then is to shrug your shoulders up, to bring your hands in line with the keyboard. And that's all the muscles around your shoulder and neck that are going to be working over time just to keep your arms there and tight, even though the movement is only really coming. I think I've got three crosses in the box so far. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an ergonomic assessment for that, it's fine. <laughs> Um, and I think another one which ne isn't necessarily ergonomics, but it's just take a break. Just stand up every 40 to 60 minutes if you can, like set a timer on your screen. It's so easy to just sit down for three hours and not realize how long you've been there for when you're engrossed in a task in hand. So true. Yeah. So true. Change the muscle groups being used. Give them a break. Okay. I'm, um, I'm just sat here now thinking, I was like, I've, I've definitely got three crosses in the box. <laughs> Um, you have to raise that mic so you can so stand far. on these. Best podcast so far. Um, <laughs> no, it's really, really, really insightful. So, kind of three tips: so eye line, screen being higher, uh, mm -hmm. hips above knees, uh, mm -hmm. stops the slumping and, cur and, cur and curling over. And then it was, yeah. was the final one about the elbows. Just taking breaks. Take taking break. breaks. Yeah. I mean, so with the elbows, it's kind of the screen height. So you want you want to be high enough that. Your feet are on the floor, but your elbows are parallel with the desk surface when they're bent. If your feet don't touch the floor when you're in that situation, like me at most desks, then you need a footstool or a shoebox if you're working from home. <laughs> yellow pages. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Does anyone have yellow pages anymore? <laughs> it must just be a website now, I think, from literally. <laughs> one off, isn't it? Like, um, no, that's super insightful. Super, super, super insightful. Um, so we've kind of, yeah, so we've worked all the way through. So we've kind of gone problem. We've looked at obviously the kind of reasons and causes. We've looked at sort of kind of some of the solutions as well. Um, how many, like, out of the people that come and see you, say out of 100 people that come and see you, how many are coming to see you with neck problems? Like what kind of percentages are you seeing? If you're going to give oh, us a wow. Um, it's quite high. I would say, uh, I would, I would say about 90% of my patients are neck or lower back problems and that's all desk related work. Um, that's, um, I might have over that a little bit because I do see quite a lot of runners. But yeah, it's, it's really high. And I'd say I see more neck related pain than I do lower back pain. Wow. It's, it's a lot. It's really? the majority of the patients I see is neck pain. It's really, um, that's really insightful because I would never have thought, you, I guess you don't have a, Really got clear mm. about how many. I mean, part of that is where I work, yeah. Canary yeah, Wharf, yeah. the city. It's um, it's the demographic that works there. But uh, yeah, it's there's a lot of people that suffer with it. No, it's super insightful. Um, Laura, I don't want to take too much more of your time because that's been really, uh, really, really helpful. Um, it's only a short one today. But um, if people want to find out more about you or they want to speak to you or get more info, what's the best place to to get hold of you? Uh, you can email me laura at purisactivehealth.co.uk or you can check out our website www.purisactivehealth.co.uk and we can leave those links in the description section below yeah absolutely absolutely get in touch guys if you found today's um podcast helpful then hit the like or subscribe button obviously as it helps us with the youtube algorithm and uh laura hopefully we can get you back on at some point soon and we can uh, delve into some more uh, uh kind of problems and solutions of the body Sure. Love Appreciate that. It. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.